Hello and welcome to a new episode of IB Physics Help video podcast. This time coming to you from the Swedish city of Malmö. Today's topic is graphs of motion. What is the purpose of plotting graphs for moving objects? How many types of graphs are there? How can we use graphs to work out quantities like speed, velocity, acceleration, distance traveled and so on? The answers to all these questions in today's podcast. Very often we use graphs for a quick pictorial representation of relationships between various physical quantities. Many of you are probably familiar with the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. If we know how to interpret graphs correctly, a quick visual analysis of a graph can provide us with valuable information about the process, phenomenon or relationship depicted by that graph. Let's consider the following simple example. The velocity of a moving body changes with time as shown on the screen. A quick glimpse at the graph reveals that the motion can be divided into three distinct sections. During the first five seconds, the body accelerates, but the acceleration is not constant. It increases until it reaches its maximum value at around three seconds into the motion, after which it starts decreasing to zero. Then the body moves at a steady speed of four meters per second, and after that it slows down or decelerates and comes to a halt. A closer inspection of the graph allows me to compare the displacements during each section. The moving body covers the most in the middle section. I can say that the displacement of the car during the deceleration process is smaller than that during the acceleration process. An even closer inspection of the graph allows me to give a rough estimate of the total displacement during the entire motion. It is around 42 meters. This is not bad considering that I haven't put yet the pen on paper so to speak. And this is not all. Useful quantities like acceleration can be calculated using such graphs. Let's see how this is done. First, a general point. When analyzing graphs of motion, we are often interested in two of their characteristics. The gradient of the graph and the area under the graph. For simplicity, our discussion is limited to one-dimensional motions. But the conclusions can be easily extrapolated to more general cases. Let's concentrate for a bit on the two characteristics of graphs that allow us to calculate various relevant quantities. First, what is the gradient or the slope of a graph? Well, to be more precise, we should rather talk about the gradient of a graph for a given point, as the value of the gradient might change from one point to another. The gradient tells us how steep the graph is. If a y versus x graph is plotted, the gradient at the point is given by the change in y over the change in x for a section of the graph around that point. Gradient is equal to change in y over change in x or, for short, delta y over delta x. Note that in the case of a linear graph, the gradient is constant and therefore we can use any two points on the line to calculate it. The value of the gradient can be either positive or negative. For graphs that are not straight lines, the gradient at the point x0 can be calculated by considering first the tangent to the graph at that point. Now, using a method similar to the one used for linear graphs, we can calculate the gradient of the graph at point x0. Let's now move on to the second relevant characteristic of graphs, the area under a graph. The area under a graph refers to the surface area delimited by the graph, the horizontal axis and vertical lines parallel to the vertical axis. Here are a few examples. By convention, the area above the horizontal axis is considered to be positive and the area below is considered to be negative. Sometimes the shape of the area under the graph is a triangle a rectangle or a trapezium. In such cases, determining the area is very easy. Generally, there are three types of graphs that can be plotted when describing a moving body. 
displacement time graphs with a subcategory called distance time graphs, velocity time graphs with a subcategory called speed time graphs, and acceleration time graphs. In each case, the gradient and area under the graph may allow us to calculate a physical quantity. Let's start with displacement time graphs. The gradient of a displacement time graph gives us the velocity. Let's see why. Consider a simple one-dimensional motion described by the graph shown on the screen. If we consider two points on the graph, the gradient of the graph represents the displacement of the moving object during the time interval delta t divided by the time interval delta t. But that's nothing else than the velocity, defined as displacement over time. So the gradient of a displacement time graph gives us the velocity, instantaneous velocity to be more precise. What about the area under the graph? On displacement time graphs, the area under the graph does not have any special meaning. Let's now move on to velocity time graphs. What does the gradient of such a graph give us? Let's consider the following example. The gradient of the graph represents the change in velocity divided by the time interval. This gives us acceleration. So the gradient of a velocity time graph represents the acceleration of a moving body. In the example on the screen, the gradient of the graph is constant, which means that the acceleration is constant. In a more general case, the acceleration at a given point in time can be calculated by drawing the tangent to the graph at that point and then calculating the gradient of that tangent. What about the area under the graph? Let's consider a body moving at a constant velocity of 6 meters per second for 9 seconds. The velocity time graph is shown below. Calculating the displacement in this case is straightforward. Covering 6 meters in a second for 9 seconds gives us a total displacement of 54 meters. Let's now calculate the area under the graph. It is a rectangle and its surface area is 9 times 6 equals 54. This suggests that the area under the graph represents the displacement which can be calculated as velocity times time interval. This is, of course, a very simple example. In my next example, I intend to show you that the result outlined above is not a coincidence. It holds for any type of motion. A section of the one-dimensional motion of a toy car is described by the graph shown on the screen. The velocity changes in time. Our goal is to calculate the displacement of the car during the time interval between t equals 0 to t equals 12 seconds. As you can see from the graph, working out the displacement as velocity multiplied by time doesn't work here since the velocity changes all the time. Which velocity should we use? Maybe some average value, but calculating that is not straightforward, since the velocity doesn't change uniformly and the time interval over which the average is to be calculated is relatively long. One solution could be to divide the total time interval into a few shorter time intervals, one second let's say, over which the velocity doesn't change significantly. It is also easier to work out an average velocity for such short time intervals. Not perfect, but we have to start somewhere. In fact, another way of looking at what I've just said is to say that during those one second intervals, the velocity is more or less constant and the blue line on the screen is our approximation of the original graph. For each of those one second intervals, the displacement can be worked out as the value of the velocity multiplied by one second, or in other words, the area of the rectangles shown on the screen. In our specific case, the average velocity in the first two seconds is 1.6 meters per second. Therefore, the displacement is 3.2 meters. During the next second, the average velocity is 1.8 meters per second, and therefore the displacement is 1.8 meters. We can work out the displacements for the remaining one second intervals. The results are shown on the screen. The total displacement is the sum of the areas of these rectangles and is approximately 20.5 meters.
Of course our method gives us a rather crude approximation of the total displacement, but I'm sure it is not hard to understand that if we now consider smaller and smaller time intervals, our result becomes a better and better approximation of the total displacement. And this brings us to the conclusion that the displacement on a velocity time graph is given by the area under that graph. Very often, the shape of the area under a graph is a triangle or a trapezium, and this would allow us to accurately determine its value. For those of you who are familiar with integral calculus, you might know that one can use integrals to calculate areas under graphs. Let's now move on to the third type of graphs, acceleration time graphs. 